this is a reading from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 17 through 27. So, my very dear friends, don't get thrown off course. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are rivers of light cascading down from the Father of light. There is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. God brought us to life using the true word, showing us off as the crown of all God's creatures. Post this at all intersections, dear friends. Lead with your ears, follow with your tongue, and let anger straggle along in the rear. God's righteousness doesn't grow from human anger, so throw all spoiled virtue and cancerous evil in the garbage. In simple humility, let our gardener, God, landscape you with the word, making a salvation garden of your life. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but, letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are, what they look like. But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life, even out of the corner of their eye and sticks with it, is no distracted scatterbrain, but a man or woman of action. That person will find delight and affirmation in the action. Anyone who sets themselves up as religious by taking a, talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air, and only hot air. Real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father, is this. Reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight and guard against corruption from the godless world. When I was a freshman in college, I made a decision because I had been sitting out here my whole life and I had never read the Bible. And as a freshman, I decided this year, I'm going to read the whole Bible. I'd never read the whole thing. I'd read bits and pieces, maybe, but mostly not. And as a freshman, I decided, I was finally smart enough to realize, if, you know, if I read a chapter or two a night over the course of a year, I will come to the end. I still have not read Marcel Proust in that same wisdom. <laughs> But there are long pieces of literature that we could read if we would just do it. The Bible itself has a little bit of everything. It has history. It has law. Oh my goodness, it's, it's horribly boring to read the books of the law. There's wisdom literature. There are, it's a song book in the middle of it, the book of Psalms about the way in which the people of God would sing about their faith. There's history of all different kinds. There's countermanding history. One historian says this, and another tells the same story, and it says this. You get to the New Testament, and there are the stories about Jesus. Then you get the church, the book of Acts. And then you get the letters, and this would maybe loosely fit into the category of New Testament letters. Letters. This book of James. James has a writing style that's very different from most things in the Bible because it's so pragmatic. It's an amazing thing when you try and incorporate this into your daily experience, you realize you're hearing from somebody who's wired up a little differently than the other writers in the Bible. Pragmatic to the core and understood the writer of James understands the challenge of, of what it means to live the Christian life. 
Soren Kierkegaard came along later, a few centuries later, and called it this, a long obedience in the same direction. I love that line, don't you? This is Kierkegaard's notion of simplicity. You know, in church, we have the opportunity to observe human nature, and every now and then someone emerges within our church, and they are completely themselves. They're totally themselves. They say it, and they live it. And you can go to the bank on that, and they are very pragmatic. Not everybody is a philosopher or theologian or historian, but these kind of people, oftentimes in times of chaos or confusion, will go to that person in the church and say, what do you think? And they are a source, a font of information to help us to think through what the chaos is about. In order for faith to be determinative, that means that faith itself shapes who you are. It may begin on the inside, but it begins to shape your life about what you think and how you react and how you relate to one another. That's the determinative faith. Uh, along comes the idea, uh, and we see it here in this first chapter of James, about vocation. Who are you? About what's your life to be about? Those of you who, are, uh, who love the poet Mary Oliver, this is what one of her main themes in life is, who are you? What are you up to? What is the purpose of life? Fred Bigner claims that we know our calling to the work we do as one, the work we need most to do. It is self-apparent in that kind of way. But then he said there's a second part of it that works in sync with it, which would be the work the world needs you to do. And you come together as a unified person, both knowing who you are, of the gifts that you have, but also having deep insight into what you should be doing, what you should be up to. And what he says is this, this classic line, the place God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. There is a coming together of being in sync with not only with yourself, but with the world or the community as a whole. In our scripture reading today, out of this segment of the first chapter, James warns us to be prepared for the coming of temptations. I mean, how practical is he at this point of just recognizing these are some of the, the places where we have failure. It's not unusual, he warns, for us to get confused about what to do or where to go. <clears throat> temptations cause us to lose our way and get confused about how to live. It's an inner confusion, we would say. I think that's what James is trying to say. And so he tells us to remember that God never changes. God never changes. When we become confused about who we are, we need to find some pipeline to get back to the unchangeability of God to allow us to find our way back, to assure us of the unchanging, immovable presence of God. And he uses the language and the images of poets. He becomes a poet. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows very poetic, very image-driven, something that we can tuck away inside of us and think about and to ponder. In order to live with confidence, we need to realize God never changes and whose light we can trust to lead us. This is the confidence, uh, this is the role of faith, we would say, in us in living in this particular way. Sometimes it's difficult to keep your orientation steady and true. I am 
I'm in a period of life where I'm facing my neuropathy. Uh, so I have a cane that I carry around. And if all the lights were suddenly to go dark, uh, you would probably pretty quickly hear me hit the floor. And this is an, an analogy of what it means for the light to go off in our lights, in our lives. The light that goes off is really what keeps us, uh, it pushes us toward chaos or confusion. It's an old wisdom lost to us who live in the city that we would go outside and just look up at the stars in the middle of the night and to realize there's orientation about that. In another era among our ancestors, they would go and look up and they would realize where they were and they would understand where the, it is that they're headed. And they got all of that information by the issue of the stars. God has taken these markers and flung them into the heavens as the lights that help us know where we are and which direction to travel. But there's more. In order to live the Christian life out in the workplace, we're given practical advice. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Some of us are really quick to the trigger in letting our anger prevail. Some of us are too quick and we don't take in enough information about what's right in front of us to even know what to be angry about. The reality is we must find ways to merge our inside faith world with our outside work world. I think what he would say about the outside work world is how we relate to one another. The way in which we have interpersonal relationships. There is a shining moment in our worship when we let you loose out in the aisle. And you walk across the way and you say hello to someone that I'm guessing you've known for a while that you love them and you care for them and they love you and care for you. You may not even talk about that, but that interpersonal rich relationship is there. And so here's what he says. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. James makes much of the ultimate sense in which we have no faith unless it's actually taking root on the inside of us. Our relationship to God is not an external thing. It's not solely wrapped up in, in that there's an inner dynamic that we must nurture and recognize and to become a part of. I think the, the contribution of uh, Christian thinking in the last 50 years or so has been to recognize this balance between the inner life and the outer life, the inner world and the outer world. James is very much in sync with that, that our interior faith must also be linked and lived in our outer daily experience. In fact, what he suggests is that the two of them would be in sync with one another. I like that. I like the recognition that both dynamics are important for us. The issue of how to live the faith, the Christian life outside the walls of this sanctuary, this place of worship, is based solely on how you answer the issue of Christian integrity. How deep do the roots go inside of you that would prompt and shape the life outside of you? And James paints a strong picture and he suggests this. What do you see when you look into a mirror? 
I love this metaphorical thinking that he's doing, which points us toward the reality that there's something for us to learn by just looking into the mirror into our own eyes and to have an honest, truthful moment with that image. Wisdom literature, this is obviously a part of that category. You know, you think about, you think about the library of the Bible and there's a shelf on it. It's not a big shelf called wisdom literature. It's in both the Hebrew scripture, it's also in the Christian scripture. These books of the Bible that are mostly about the wisdom of living. Wisdom literature always connects the possession of wisdom with its practice. There is a sense in which the living of faith has some dualities to it. Not only the inner, the outer, but what you think and what you do. And matching those things up as a part of things. Wisdom is described as a spotless mirror that reflects God. In other words, when we really come to the place that we can look in the mirror honestly about ourselves, what we're observing is the image of God that is at work within us. By looking into the mirror of God, one can determine whether the life is being lived according to the practice of the wisdom of God. That's a very tough comparison. It demands that we be completely honest with ourselves and with God. Professor Ralph Martin helps us pull all these pieces together into a coherent message that you can actually tuck away into your pocket. That's the, the beauty of the book of James is the availability of what he has to say that you could just tuck it in your pocket and walk out of here with it to think about it more in the week to come. He claims the book of James, this Professor Martin, involves the, the parts of the body in the schema of Christian maturity. <coughs> the tongue, this is his metaphor, the tongue speaks rarely and never in anger. The ears hear the word and obey. The eyes see, they actually can see with clarity and remember the images reflected in the law of wisdom. Finally, he talks about the hands. This is the way in which our outer world is described, is the way in which we handle things, the way in which we use our hands, carrying out the deeds, I love the part of this church that recognizes that it has both an inner life and an outer life. It honors those two realities. It recognizes the duality between our inner world, which is deeply spiritual, and the outer world that is deeply spiritual in an altogether different but similar way. There's an old adage from the preacher who was asked why he kept preaching week after week the same old message. And he replied that he recognized that the problem with most of us was that there were still parts of us who had not heard the gospel yet. St. Francis of Assisi said it this way, share the gospel always. And if necessary, use words. I like that balance, don't you? I like the pragmatism of James. And James would say amen to that kind of wisdom. Amen.